All right, we, we, let's get started, please. Um, well, this is something that I would like to show a little bit later, which is an important thing, actually. Oh. Um, we were talking about the situation in Iraq, the war, I mean, that followed the invasion of Iraq. Uh, that was a short-lived war. Well, not too many casualties. And Iraq was put under sanctions with the resolution 687. And that was a ceasefire agreement, remember? These are all uh, issues that we have covered over the past uh, Tuesday and also the previous Friday last week. Um, what was significant from our perspective was paragraph 33 of 687, which declares that there was a ceasefire. I explained the significance of ceasefire, the meaning of ceasefire, and that the ceasefire was conditional upon the proper implementation of uh, the provisions prior to uh, article, I'm uh, sorry, paragraph 33, meaning all of them, 32 of them, but more specifically paragraphs 8, 9, and 10, which made specific references to the destruction, removal, or rendering harmless of chemical and biological weapons, uh, as well as material that are used in their production, and ballistic missiles uh, having ranges above 150 kilometers, and also the nuclear infrastructure had to be destroyed or rendered harmless. Th this task was given to the IAEA and I try to explain to you that IAEA did its job, completed the mandate without much difficulty. There were basically a couple of reasons. They were fast and there were not that many nuclear uh, sites that they would have to deal with when compared to chemical and biological. And after all, it is very difficult to hide some nuclear material because they emit radiation, and also uh, to hide nuclear facilities because they are usually big. And most people uh, had prior knowledge about their whereabouts, I mean, as to where they were uh, located. So the IAEA also got uh, significant cooperation, and these were the years when the Iraqi authorities did not direct their feet, and they were cooperating with with the International Atomic Energy Agency. So, but on that hand, remember, United Nations Special Commission, ANSCOM was created, and ANSCOM, of course, uh, with cooperation getting, uh, that they got from the Iraqi authorities, escort, as well as uh, protection, and specific information about the locations of facilities, and the material, and the weapons, as well as ballistic missiles. So for several years, they have done their job properly without much difficulty, but in due course, remember, uh, a number of inspectors, and more specifically, Scott Ritter is, he himself uh, actually uh, maybe, I don't know for what reason, uh, declared that he received information intelligence from several sources and that was found to be unacceptable by the Iraqis. And Saddam Hussein first tried to uh, put, a, put an end uh, to these inspections <clears throat> in 96, and, but he was confronted with the uh, US Desert Fox operation, which persuaded, convinced uh, Saddam Hussein that he should continue uh, allowing the inspectors do their job, but finally, after a second round, he said, okay, I'm withdrawing the escorts, the, the people who protect as well as guide the inspectors. And he, when, once they are withdrawn, the United Nations Secretary General had no other choice but to withdraw them. And therefore, when we come to the end of 1998, uh, inspections were stalled. I mean, there were no inspectors starting from uh, December 1998 no inspections anymore. And while well, that was partly because uh, there was no escorts for the inspectors and, and because of the withdrawal of them, but the international community was pretty much concerned from, I mean, starting from um, April 1991, so there is this 
uh, almost for, uh, nine years. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, seven and a half years, so almost eight years of inspections. And as I said here last time, there were many people who lost their lives, especially women, children, because they couldn't uh, have access to food, medication, uh, things that were necessary for the survival of the large population who were under a lot of pressure anyway, even before the war, during the war, and after the war. So uh, during all these years, there were these inspections and hundreds of uh, kilograms or tons of some chemical materials uh, or weapons, ballistic missiles, a number of them, biological agents, large uh, stocks of them were destroyed or rendered harmless. So that was the period which uh, actually witnessed a significant operation of ANSCOM, and there were uh, hun maybe a couple of hundreds of people who were involved in the inspection processes. Our inspectors from uh, around the world have joined ANSCOM. But uh, one thing, there was not a single, if I'm not mistaken, and actually that this is something that I had confirmed with Rolf Ekeus, uh, who was the head of the ANSCOM at the beginning, um, this guy, but that's when we met just uh, last year in December uh, last year, but I had a prior meeting with him when he came to Monterey Institute, when, when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute in California, and I asked him, indeed kind of uh, asked him in a very uh, tough manner as to why ANSCOM didn't have any Turkish inspectors because that would be a great opportunity for Turkish people, experts, to um, know first-hand information about the situation on the ground. He actually said, don't ask me, ask your Turkish authorities as to why they have not accepted sending one. Well, as far as I understand, there was some sort of a tacit understanding between the parties, uh, Turkey and the United States, maybe, another, maybe the Iraqis at some point, uh, to not send Turkish inspectors to any of the ANSCOM missions. But it would have been great if Turkish inspectors were involved or were among the uh, ANSCOM inspectors who were going every place, every location to get intelligence about the uh, uh, Iraqis and weapons infrastructure and other information. But um, according to Rolf Ekeus, I don't know where the Turkish authorities really got this offer and denied or declined to uh, send anyone. But that was what he said back in 96 or 97, I can't remember exactly when. So, uh, by the way, ANSCOM inspectors uh, were using state-of-the-art technology. I mean, another gain from such inspections for the inspectors themselves would be to have access to new technologies as to what kind of technology were uh, being used for detecting uh, some hidden material such as uh, biological agents, chemical agents, as well as nuclear uh, material. For instance, uh, during a chat, when I, I gave a lecture to the students of Monterey Institute about something, and uh, as I mentioned last time, Tim McCarty, a friend of mine from the Institute, but part of the ANSCOM inspections, and he was an inspector, and one guy asked, one of the students asked, well, we are selling weapons to the world. And these weapons can be used to, against our soldiers in the future. So, um, I mean, is this fair? Why, why are we doing this? Why are we selling to uh, a number of countries which in the future may become uh, you know, hostile to us? And uh, actually, I said something uh, that I kind of knew from uh, my readings, from my discussions with experts that uh, that producers of sophisticated weapon systems were implanting, let's say, uh, a number of uh, softwares in the weapons, such as missiles uh, or other electronic equipment that could be used in future contingencies. And if, for instance, a missile is launched against your soldiers, for instance, or against uh, targets that belong to you, then by activating that software, that missile might be just devi deviating from its uh, trajectory or hit somewhere else or may just destroy itself. And that same would be applicable to uh, aircraft, um, uh, just uh, not only missiles, or anything that would operate with electronic equipment. 
So that was something that I had in kind of vague knowledge, not specifically, uh, or not, nothing much about the specifics, but at least uh, by using our, of course, logic and intellect and uh, bits of information, you can understand that weapons producers could do something like that. And that uh, inspector friend of mine uh, confirmed what I said and said, don't worry guys, in every single weapon system that we sell to the world, there are such uh, systems, there are such softwares that we can make them not usable against us uh, in the future. So therefore, it is very, very important to know what kind of technologies are being developed and what kind of uh, uh, weapon systems are being developed if, if you are uh, a responsible for weapons acquisition. And uh, there was this discussion, this debate uh, also in, in Turkey about uh, Turkey desiring to buy some weapon systems or, or develop or produce a new, new set of uh, F-16s, but uh, to uh, develop the software in Turkey by Turkish uh, specialists, because Turkey did not have much trust about the um, reliability of the software that could be uh, that could make these uh, F-16s, for instance, in the future uh, unusable by uh, giving this opportunity to the other side, whomever that might be, to sort of uh, manipulate with the navigation system, interfere with it, etc. So another thing that I again uh, learned from uh, just a bit of information was that no matter what you do to crush uh, the the computers physically. Even if you just, uh, I don't know, burn it or just use any worst of, uh, worst of uh, viruses and infect it and make it unusable for normal people like us. But there were some, uh, again, softwares that could be, uh, retrieve, that could get the information. Every single uh, information that were inserted to that document could be retrieved, could be recovered. So that's how, for instance, uh, information about uh, Iraqi biological weapons program uh, was somehow unearthed uh, from the hardwares uh, uh, or hard, hard drives of uh, some of the computers which were just put in, dumped somewhere in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the waste and somehow they retrie retrieve, they, they recover the information in their uh, hard drives and use them as a proof of uh, Iraqi weapons uh, involvement or just involvement in biological weapons in the past. So that's how uh, Iraq was put under pressure to sign the biological weapons uh, uh, convention. So what I'm trying to say here is unscrewing inspections have gained a lot of experience to the inspectors and thereby to their intelligence services and to their country. Almost every single inspector from X and Y countries, once they span up term in Iraq, they were going back to their countries, they were being debriefed by their intelligence services, secret services, and then uh, put back to their <laughs> job. So therefore, that will, that will be a great opportunity for Turkish inspectors if they were sent to ANSCOM or UNMOVIC uh, in the future, uh, uh, if they could operate in Iraq with other inspectors. And not only that, you go to the field, get information from first hand, and, but also you discuss with other inspectors as to what they know. So I don't know why Turkey missed that opportunity. Well, or maybe we had a lot of confidence that we did not need that kind of in, in intelligence or information. Anyway, so uh, then let's go back to the story here from uh, uh, in December 98. As I said, one reason was that the withdrawal of escorts uh, left the UN Secretary General with no other option but to withdraw the inspectors. Without, if he did not withdraw them, uh, the, these people, then their lives would be in danger. That would be unacceptable, of course. So, but again, uh, a year later, remember, UN Security Council Resolution 1284. You have all this uh, on websites. And that resolution, 17th of December, this resolution said, taking into consideration that for exactly one year, uh, there were no inspections in Iraq because uh, in December 98, the last inspectors uh, have left the country. And in January 99, Richard Butler 
presented uh, his report to the yes, the one in the middle <laughs> here, and uh, he presented his report to the UN Security Council, which was adopted unanimously. And that report, well, long one, as I mentioned, uh, maybe not directly specifically, but hinted at the possibility of some chemical weapons and biological agents maybe remaining uh, in the Iraqi territory because he could not ensure that all of the weapons were somehow destroyed, removed, or rendered harmless because, I mean, they were not getting enough cooperation from the Iraqi authorities. So, considering the situation in Iraq, that there were no inspections, and after inspectors having left the territory, the UN Security Council Resolution 687 mandate was not yet fulfilled. Oops. Uh, 687, the mandate was not fulfilled. I mean, the, the inspectors could not present a report to the UN Security Council saying that we have done our job, we have finished the task, there is not a single gram of chemical agent that could be weaponized or not, not even a weapon or no biological agents, no missiles, so we can go home. There was no such a report. On the contrary, the report submitted by Richard Butler presented to the UN Security Council suggested that some material or weapons or uh, material that could be weaponized might have remained there. So with this psyche and time having passed already, uh, the United Nations Security Council had to you know, take some decisions in order to pursue its own pr decisions, prior decisions, like 687. But that year was significant because, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, in March or April, NATO summit took place in Washington, D.C., and the, the heads of states of uh, NATO allies had to adopt a strategic concept document that would shed light uh, to the future implementation of some of the NATO strategies and, you know, force deployments and, and contingency plans. So that was, uh, again, January, uh, uh, sort of March or April 99. There was also this Kosovo operation by NATO. Therefore, the world's attention was shifted from Iraq to the Balkans. But yet again, toward the end of the year 1999, United Nations Security Council had to take a decision which, after all, was 1284. And remember, with this decision suggested to Saddam Hussein uh, to allow the new inspectors, United Nations Monitoring Verification Commission, Inspection Commission, and saying that ANSCOM was abolished, because of its corruption, et cetera, et cetera, and that a new in body of inspections, inspectors was created, and that if and when inspectors resumed, I mean started again, then the United Nations would uh, suspend uh, m m the bulk of sanctions, major uh, items in these sanctions that were imposed upon Iraq, uh, they would s s uh, suspend them, uh, and that they would allow Iraqi to buy some foods, medication, and other stuff that they would need uh, so long as Anmovic operated on the field. Anmovic, of course, uh, again, was, was, would still be a body of inspectors, but never had a chance to go there in all these years until November 2002. That was after the September 11 attacks, when, of course, the world just was shocked with what happened on that day, attacks on uh, Twin Towers of World Trade Center and the Pentagon, etc. And, of course, first Afghanistan, but then eventually United States turns, turned its face to Iraq. And I was kind of expecting this because there was this 687 ceasefire resolution. And while the, if not the rest of the world, but most people in the world uh, were discussing as to whether um, the U.S. president, now George W. Bush, would have any legal sort of uh, uh, 
uh, backup for for uh, supporting its his argument that Iraq, you know, should again come under fire unless they cooperated. Most people didn't think that that was, or maybe forgotten that there was a ceasefire resolution. And once you forget the pr existence of ceasefire resolution, then of course you can also forget or not, cannot anticipate what might come after that. A ceasefire resolution was always, as I always said, interim solution subject to certain conditions, and if conditions are not met by one of the parties, the other party uh, might just make this a case and declare to the other party that, you know, uh, unless you comply with the conditions and, and, uh, and do whatever it is necessary, then I will resume fire again. So I could see that the United States uh, president would make reference to the ceasefire resolution at some point, saying that, Iraq has not uh, allowed us to fill, fill, fill the job, so they have violated the uh, ceasefire, and after all, they had all this, this, this and that things that they have done illegally, so now we have the right to resume fire. Finally, of course, that was something that happened in March 2003, a year uh, or just several months later, but in November, of course, uh, after 9-11, Iraq found itself under heavy pressure, and under the pressure, and uh, after long deliberations at the United Nations, finally uh, Saddam Hussein accepted the entry of Anmovik to the Iraqi territory with some conditions. And Hans Blix was the person who was this guy, um, who was in charge of. Sorry for that. who was in charge of the proper implementation of Anmovik inspections. Well, uh, the head of Anmovik, Hans Blix, and the head of IAEA, Mohamed El Baradei, actually they both uh, uh, appear before the United Nations Security Council, and they sort of uh, presented their reports about the situation in Iraq. The, the problem with Anmovik was kind of uh, intriguing because on the one hand from December 98 till November 2002 there were no inspections in Iraq so almost four years um, or to be exact 47 months no single inspector put his her foot on the Iraqi territory in between this period December 98 November 2002 but in the meantime there is this Butler's report, which implies, if not directly uh, says, that there might be some chemical weapons and ballistic missiles and biological agents, etc. Because, well, actually, since they have not been able to make sure that they have completed their job, I'm just and that they have destroyed every single uh, amount of or weapon or material that could be weaponized, so his report implied that, and what would be the normal course of action for the new inspectors once they are in Iraq now would be to ask the Iraqi authorities, all right guys, I mean, for the last four years there has been no single inspection here, so now we have come here to finish the job and please bring, a, uh, bring to us whatever chemical, biological agent you may have or just ballistic missile you may have and let, let us destroy them so that we paved the way to a peace treaty. I mean, that would be normal course of action if ANSCOM had been able to finish the job before being sort of uh, forced to go out. But the Iraqi authorities' reply was, you know what, there is no uh, weapon, chemical weapons or biological weapons or ballistic missiles left. We have destroyed ourselves whatever might have been left. The ANSCOM uh, Almovic of course, would have no objection to that, provided that that could ascertain, ascertain this situation. I mean, that could sort of, uh, uh, you know, provide assurances to the world, first for themselves and for the, for the rest of the world, that Iraqis have themselves destroyed this material, or ballistic missiles, whatever. But the point was, even though the Iraqis claimed that there was not even a single ballistic missile left, or uh, or chemical or biological weapons uh, left in the country, they could not provide enough uh, uh, 
uh, sort of information to verify their position. I mean, that, that was not even a ballistic missile. I mean, they have gone, uh, they have taken the inspectors, Almovic inspectors, to certain sites where they claim to have destroyed the remaining material, and these inspectors have taken samples from water, soil, air, in order to see if there was any evidence that you know, would uh, suggest that there was a certain amount of chemical material dumped there and destroyed. Or they have said, okay, we have uh, destroyed these missiles over this hill, for instance, and they have checked the satellite pictures. And they have not seen any single activity going on during the period that they, the Iraqis claimed to have destroyed these missiles themselves. So the problem was, Almovic was unable to um, underwrite or to ascertain, to, to, to sort of uh, support with evidence what the Iraqis said, that they, were, that they had themselves destroyed the remaining material and weapons, and that there was no weapon remained. Well, it is very difficult to uh, provide enough evidence about that, uh, that there is uh, something is missing. So long as you can find something, it is missing. Or that might also suggest that it doesn't exist. The problem is that, we, I mean, Almovi could not find anything. Is it because there was nothing to find, or is it because these whatever material uh, was left uh, was somehow well hidden well somewhere, or just you know taken away to another country maybe? So that was a problem that really tackled the minds of many people. And Almovic, because it was unable to present evidence about uh, either way about the situation, was, of course, uh, has come under fire, under criticism. And this is this problem about lies, about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction uh, capability. Eventually, politicians also have admitted that, well, they may not have told the truth because of lack of information or because of lack of enough information that could not be provided by their subordinates, I mean, people working under them. Some uh, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of uh, State in the United States, President himself, acknowledged after so many years that they may have done something wrong about their allegations. But the problem here is, Almovic could not find or destroy anything. Was it because there was nothing to find and destroy, or was it because whatever might have been left, according to Butler's report, may have been hidden somewhere or taken away from the Iraqi territory. That was the question. Uh, so we have seen interesting reports, interesting publications, articles, books, one of which was by Richard Butler. Remember the, the guy whom you've seen the picture, uh, a former Marine who had done a lot of job uh, for the uh, Undisclosure of uh, some of the Iraqis' uh, capabilities. Well, this guy, because of heavy criticism, because of his uh, involvement in some of the uh, illicit, let's say, or unethical uh, uh, issues with the uh, other in in intelligence services, he resigned. And I would like to bring to your attention several s sentences from his resignation letter. 26 August 1998. In December 1998, you know, um, inspectors were withdrawn. Uh, he writes a letter to Richard Butler, and who was the ANSCOM uh, director of ANSCOM. He explains the reason why he um, resigned here. This paragraph is significant. It says, the special commission was created for the purpose of disarming Iraq. As part of the Special Commission theme, I have worked to achieve a simple end, the removal, destruction, or rendering harmless of Iraq's proscribed weapons. The sad truth is that Iraq today, in August 98, Iraq today is not disarmed anywhere near the level required by Security Council resolutions. As you know, ANSCOM has good reason to believe that there are significant numbers of proscribed weapons and related components and the means to manufacture such weapons unaccounted for in Iraq today. 
So the, the leading inspector, the most you know, or heroic figure among the inspectors, who has done a great deal in unearthing Iraq's clandestine capabilities. Because of this controversy, because of this role between himself and those who you know, criticize him, he resigna resignated. He quit in August 98. And he says, Iraq is not even close to disarming. There are still significant amount of weapons, material, whatever in August 98, which was followed by the withdrawal of a few months later of the inspectors. And from that point onward to November 2002, no inspections, no inspectors. So this Scott Ritter, who writes and who was the sort of first and foremost person to be able to report from the field about the true situation, in his resignation letter says, Iraq still has weapons, a lot of them. And until November 2002, for four, uh, 48 or so months, no inspections. And once Anscomic, uh, Anmovic, sorry, uh, goes to Iraq, Iraqis say, well, we don't have weapons. Well, whatever might have been left, we may have destroyed. Here, what, where we dumped the chemical weapons, well, no, uh, no trace, no evidence. Here where we have destroyed ballistic missiles, no evidence. So Anmovic was unable to uh, support the Iraqis claim that they had destroyed these weapons themselves. But on the, on the other hand, Anmovic could not find anything. Well, sometimes you may not find anything un provided that they are very well hidden. So unless there is something to find, if, if taken away or very well hidden somewhere, you cannot find it. So by the way, Anmovic its mandate was not to find certain things, but was to verify that Iraqis, if they have done so, destroy themselves. In the United Nations Monitoring Verification Inspection Commission could not uh, sort of verify, could not support that Iraqis have done this themselves. And there is this resignation letter saying that Iraq still has weapons. And after that letter, the inspectors were withdrawn, never come back until uh, 48 months later. And once they come back, there is no weapons around. Does this mean that Iraq never had these weapons anymore? That was the problem. Of course, everybody made uh, different types of claims. Uh, but what was the most striking was Scott Ritter, who wrote this resignation letter, who said in his letter that there was still, it was not disarmed, that there was still a significant amount of weapons. He said, all was lie. Iraq never had such weapons. And we lied to the world. And he published books, might have made several millions of dollars so far. Well, good for him. But he confused the minds of many people. That is actually something that is not understandable at least uh, from my perspective, because uh, a heroic figure like the, him, someone who helped with the uh, inspections, which uh, were carried out under very difficult conditions, and he was quite significant in finding many of the uh, caches, many of the hidden material. But later on, and having written such a resignation letter, says, well, uh, actually, Iraq had never had such weapons. It is not that easy for someone like me who scanned the almost uh, on a daily basis the situation evolving in Iraq from day one um, and having uh, either in, the, in, in due course uh, had the chance to talk with other people who were involved in the inspection, inspections and with the heads of inspecting teams. Uh, I had myself, my reasons to believe that some material may really have been left in the Iraqi territory. But the problem was, well, uh, if you cannot find it, they, 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 they doesn't exist. Is this the principle? I don't know. Maybe it shouldn't be. And the problem was, of course, uh, not only within the context of Iraq's uh, uh, sort of position vis-a-vis -vis the UN Security Council resolution, but also we, I mean, uh, being in Turkey here, we should also be concerned because 
if there were some chemical weapons and or biological weapons and or ballistic missiles left, left in Iraq after the withdrawal of the inspectors in December 98 and somehow hidden somewhere in the Iraqi territory or in neighboring countries, well, the probability of these material being recovered by other groups, militia groups or other countries, and that could be used against our soldiers. Who, how do you know uh, that this is not going to happen? So that was a major concern. And therefore, um, I think the uh, authorities in Turkey and elsewhere had to be more concerned about what exactly was the uh, truth, was the reality here. So uh, this is something that you have to bear in mind, that you know, when you hear something or again, by way of research or anything, writing a paper. Uh, if you are interested in the subject, you will, of course, come across with many statements made by the um, United States Secretary of State, uh, who was at some point Colin Powell, former general. Um, also, U.S. President himself, George W. Bush, in, on different occasions, in different fora, they said, well, some of the information about Iraq may not have been correct. So you cannot fool the minds of people by just manipulating the information like this. And there are certain, if not evidence, because uh, some people with respect to Scott Ritter's uh, resignation letter, when I said, look, he says that today all was lie and that there is no such weapon and that he sort of uh, took on the US uh, government, US administration, Bush administration for uh, creating the uh, the ground, or preparing the ground for an attack on Iraq. But on the other hand, he has this resignation letter in which he admits that there are still weapons. And some people said, well, he was under a different psyche, he was under different psychological you know, pressure, and etc. Therefore, his re the resignation letter may not make sense. I don't know. I mean, this is not such an uh, uh, easy or simple thing. But m I tend to believe what Scott Ritter has written in his resignation letter was true. And if that was true, because he was the person who was in a position to see the things from uh, the very first hand on the ground, and if that was true, where have these weapons gone? Well, some weapons, especially chemical weapons, uh, may lose their significance in due course over, over a certain period of time, like I mean, six, seven, eight, ten, whatever years, they may, they may become useless. They don't, you don't have to sort of uh, uh, destroy them even because you know, th th their composition may somehow be uh, affected by time and corrosion or the you know, climatic conditions. Unless they kept under certain pressure and temperature, they may become useless after a while. That's fine, but still material in these weapons may have some toxic effects. Or how do you know, maybe they, they, they're uh, uh, life cycle might be longer than w many people might expect. The problem here is if that letter represented the truth as well as this report, uh, I mean letter in August 98 and report in January 99, both of which, one of which explicitly states that there are still weapons and the other one implies that there might be weapons and the United Nations Security Council uh, uh, sort of uh, adopts this report of Butler unanimously. And then there is this uh, time passing, Almovic going to Iraq and no weapons are found. And people say, well, there is no weapon at all. This is not that easy and a, a much more uh, uh, significant research must have been carried out. And at least uh, maybe Turkey must have pressurized on something to happen because this is something that can directly affect the uh, security of our people as well as our security forces. After all, because this is a country just nearby and there, are, there is still not um, uh, the state of uh, stable political conditions do not still exist in Iraq. And this being the situation, we should be concerned about militia groups or other groups in Iraq having access to the you know, places where these weapons may still have been uh, stored. Even if 
their military use may have somehow be badly affected because of the conditions where they, they were kept and time which has passed so far. So this is something that I just uh, wanted to emphasize here today, that um, uh, you have to be quite, um, I don't know, on alert positions when, when such things happen, and you have to be part of it. Had Turkey sent a number of inspectors to this pool of inspectors, primarily on Ansko, I heard something like, you know, Turkey would have sent uh, a few Anmo inspectors to Anmovik, but even if Turkey did so, Anmovik could not operate, could not, you know, get a large, large amount of uh, in intelligence from the field. But for so many years, for approximately eight years, Anscom inspectors have collected large piles of intelligence supports for their own country's intelligence services, many of them. Some of them I know were pure scientists and de declined to be de debriefed once they sent back or once they uh, returned back to their homes. Some scientists said, uh, with uh, some of whom I had conversations, who said they did not accept to be debriefed by their intelligence services because they did not find this ethical. Well, that's, uh, that's an, an, an approach. But after all, that would be a huge service to the country if Turkey had sent inspectors to Anscom, which was unfortunately not the case, but not because of Anscom, who did not accept. No, they, there was no offer. Actually, they offered Turkey to send inspectors, but Turkey declined. And that is something that one has to uh, think about. It. All right, um, we'll continue on Tuesday. There will be class on Tuesday and the coming uh, Friday, so no, on Friday next week, no class because it's 29th of October, the Republic Day, but on Tuesday 26th, we'll be here and I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you for coming. <laughs>